Hey everyone, Britta Albert here. If this is your first time here, I'm a spiritual transformational life coach. It's my goal for this channel to help you overcome the obstacles that are standing in the way of you living your best and most authentic life. In today's video, I'm continuing on with my little mini series about the big trauma healing that I received over this past six weeks. Now, if you have not watched the previous two videos, I do recommend go ahead and check those out because that will make this video make a lot more sense and you'll have an idea of how we got to where we are now. Also, if this is your first time here, please don't forget to subscribe and like this video if it resonates with you or if you enjoyed it or if you learned something or if you saw a new perspective that you've never seen before. And don't forget to hit the bell notification so that you never miss out on a future video. So picking up where we left off in the last video, it was my senior year, I had graduated, and I started to do a lot of crazy stuff those two months in between graduation and when I shipped off into the army. One of the things that I felt guilty about is I felt that the attention that I received in high school, I did not handle it very well. I went from homeschooled to a private Christian school where there was not much male attention and the male attention that I initially received was very negative. Um, and then at the tail end, my freshman year started to have some better encounters, found myself in a little bit of a sticky situation and ended up with my first real boyfriend. Then I went to public school those next two years and experienced a lot more uh, attention. I'm not going to call it pressure per se, but there was some of that as well. But I experienced a lot more attention than I had ever received. And I had a lot of guilt for the way that I handled it. I did not feel like I handled it very well. I felt like I was always hurting somebody. I felt like I could not trust myself. And I believed that I was a bad person. I believed that even though I didn't sleep with people, I still believed that I was a slut. Those were judgments that I had towards myself leaving high school and going into the military. Also, bearing in mind my mental health at the time and the fact that I had been struggling with depression and suicidal thoughts for the previous roughly, so since I was 12 and I was 18, so roughly six years at that point. So I go into the military and immediately I regret it. I am crying from day one. I went in thinking I was some badass who was going to protect the world and fight for the rights of my friends and my family and I was going to be this hero. I didn't, I didn't have this superhero mentality per se where I think I'm gonna like stand out, but I'm gonna be part of something much bigger than myself. I'm going to be a part, I'm going to be a soldier i a part of the army. That's pretty awesome. And then I get there and I realize I'm terrified of everything. What was I thinking? I remember they put this gun in front of me, this not even a gun, they put this rifle in front of me, an M16, and they tell you, take it apart clean it and put it back together. I had never seen this weapon in my life before. I had never touched one of these before. The closest I got was when my dad let me shoot a BB gun when I was little. I, oh my gosh. So this is sitting in front of me. They give you this like placemat looking thing that it shows the different parts of the weapon and you're supposed to figure out how to take it apart, clean it and put it back together. And I just start crying because I don't know what I'm doing. And the drill sergeants are yelling and <laughs> I'm laughing y'all because it was so ridiculous. Looking back now, again, knowing what I know now, I know so many people who are in the military and I know like they love day one. Yeah, they wait for it. Drill sergeants from other areas, they'll come when there's a new batch of soldiers just to mess with them. And I was taking it all so seriously because I didn't know. <sighs> so, um, a, a guy who I'm still friends with to this day, he comes and he sits next to me and 
he just says he doesn't say a word but he makes eye contact with me and then he looks down at his weapon and looks at mine and makes eye contact with me again and he starts taking his apart and so he's pointing and he's not saying anything and he's showing me what he's doing so I immediately start copying him and following what he's doing and he's showing me how to take it apart how to clean it how to put it back together I ended up becoming really proficient in that actually and I became really confident in myself with using that weapon uh, but that was about one of the only things that I felt confident with in my entire limited military experience <laughs> I was very depressed while I was there and I wasn't getting any sleep because the females in my bay were fighting all night long and then the drill sergeant would come in and yell at everybody and they called it getting smoked where they'd yell at you and they'd make you like do push-ups and flutter kicks and um, hold a plank or just random stuff whatever they could think of at the time. So I'm exhausted and I'm terrified and I'm alone and you get yelled at really for talking. There's a very, very, especially in the beginning, there's a very limited amount of time that you have to yourself. Even if you go to the bathroom, you have to bring somebody with you. Everywhere you go, you go by yourself or you can't go by yourself. You have to go with somebody who's of your same gender. Now, little did I know there was a boy who saw me and was trying to get my attention. And I did not see him initially. And the more time went on, the more small bits of freedom we had, where we were able to talk, usually was in the evening when we we're like shining our boots, which they don't do that anymore. It shows you how long ago it was that I was in there. This is before they moved to the boots that they have now, back when you had the black ones and you actually had to sit there and shine your boots every single night. So that was kind of the, the social time that we had. So the slower that you took shining your boots, the more socializing you could do. And there were many more guys than there were girls. And so even, it, any anyone who's been in the military, or definitely any female who's been in the military can attest, it really doesn't matter what you look like. They're gonna make you feel like you are the most attractive person on the face of the earth just because you're a female. And it, the ratio is like 80 to one. So if I thought I had attention before, I didn't know what attention was. And I remember there was one day where we were out in the field and I don't know what we were doing, but I was at the back of the line and we were standing in line to get our food. And there was this boy in front of me and he turned around. I'm all depressed and emo-ish. I say something along the lines of that I was lost and forgotten and I don't know, it was just a particularly dark day for me. And he picks me up and I'm like, I'm scared we're gonna get in trouble. He, this kid, this kid got me in trouble so many times and almost got me in trouble way more times. But anyway, he picked me up by my shoulders and literally turned me and set me in front of him so that he was now in the back of the line. And he told me from that point forward, I would never be left alone and forgotten again. Instant crush. Cute emoji heart eyes. Who was this person in this world where nobody would make eye contact with you? Nobody would smile. If they made eye contact with you, they were probably yelling at you. Where I was so starved for basic human kindness. I felt seen by this boy. Regardless if it was the beginnings of a crush, I didn't really know how I felt about him yet. And we started talking and he would find his way. And I didn't realize this until he told me later, but he had seen me since day one. And he had, when they split the different platoons up, he had counted the people and situated himself down the line so that he would actually end up in my same platoon. So when they were, when they were taking everybody, when everybody first got downrange and they were they were splitting people up into different groups. He made sure that he not only got in my group, 
but he also got in my line. So that would be my squad. And I, I mean, you want to talk about feeling seen. He had been doing things and maneuvering and trying to get my attention for apparently weeks and I was completely oblivious, completely self-absorbed in my depression and in my fear that I hadn't noticed him. But when I noticed him, I noticed him. I would love to say I knew from the beginning and it was love at first sight. But I didn't know what my heart wanted and I still didn't know who I was and I still struggled with the depression and really the depression was the most dominant thing in my life. And I still wanted to hurt myself. And I ended up, I ended up getting hurt in um, basic and I ended up, I broke a bone in my ankle, I broke a bone in my knee and I got stress fractures in my hips. And so there were things that I, you have this final, they call it an FTX, or at least they did back then. And it's like, it's like a week long camping trip roughly. And then you're supposed to do this 10 mile ruck march back to your base. And that was needed in order to graduate. Well, I got hurt. I kept, every time I got hurt, I didn't realize how hurt I was and I just kept going, kept going, kept going. Cause the whole thing is drink water, press on. And I went until I couldn't go anymore. When the pain was so intense and my ankle was so swollen and my legs hurt and my hips hurt and I, I couldn't move anymore. It was done. I had pushed too far and I was just sobbing my eyes out and drill sergeant yelling at me, what, what the F is wrong with you? And I just, I, I'm in so much pain. I can't, just can't go on. So I had to leave the FTX and go stay at this like medical holdover place because I couldn't go back to my bay because nobody was there. Everybody was on the FTX. So while I'm there, you still can't go anywhere by, by yourself. You're still with somebody of your same gender. You, they call it your battle buddy. And so there was this one girl and she really wanted to, she was also hurt, but she really wanted to get back to her group. She wanted to be able to graduate on time. She didn't want to have to be what they call a holdover where your group graduates without you and then you have to wait until you heal and then you get put with another group and then have to graduate and move on. And she didn't want that and I didn't want that because for me, I had made friends in my group. I didn't want to start over. I didn't want to come into a group that was already halfway through and I didn't, I didn't want to be left behind. Because remember, he told me I would never be left behind and forgotten again and that stuck with me. So she was determined to keep up her strength and she was determined to overcome whatever her injury was. I can't even remember what it was. And so I was right there with her. And so, you know, our upper bodies were fine. Um, I don't know what she hurt, but I know that her upper body was fine. My upper body was fine. And so we would do sit-ups and we would do um, a, like modified planks and things like that and modified push-ups so that we're still working our upper bodies but we're not damaging our, our injuries further. And I remember she asked if she could go to the restroom or whatever, and the, or whoever was in charge of us said yes, if you had to take a battle buddy with you. And of course she grabbed me because we, we were becoming friends. So I follow her into the bathroom and the door closes. And before I know it, she is making out with me. And I didn't know, I don't know. It wasn't the first time I'd kissed a girl, but I had never been attacked by a girl before. And because of some of the things that I'm gonna share with you, I didn't realize that there was trauma in that moment because that's something that is more socially accepted. Going back to the first video, and what my understanding with Adam and Eve and how I felt that God felt towards women 
and how I felt my role was as a female, something like that seems to cater more to the male ego than the female ego, so I thought. So this was the first experience where I also felt that it was my fault for potentially giving signals of something that I didn't mean to. And again, growing up in the private Christian school, if somebody has feelings for you or, or somebody thinks that it always goes back to, if you're a female, you need to check yourself. Are you unintentionally flirting with somebody? What are the kind of clothes that you're wearing? What are you doing? What are you saying? Are you making eye contact? Like there's, there's so many rules to being a female that makes things your fault, that you're asking for it, or that you were inviting it, or that you were open to it. I had, up until all of this healing came about, I had forgotten about that memory because I didn't really think that it was that big of a deal. And maybe what you're thinking is the big deal really isn't the big deal to me. It wasn't the fact that it was a female. That didn't bother me. It was the fact that it was uninvited and that I blamed myself for leading her on or making her feel like there was something more than there was. And I felt bad. I felt like that was my fault. Instead of saying, this person overstepped boundaries, I, I felt guilty. I did something. It was my fault. And I didn't realize that that also carried its own version of trauma. Because even though it wasn't an encounter with a male, it was still reaffirming those beliefs that I had about myself. And it reaffirmed the perception of value or lack of value that I had for myself. It's like I believed that simultaneously I'm supposed to be everybody's plaything, yet I'm also supposed to maintain innocence and virtue. And I'm not supposed to lead people on. And even if I didn't intentionally lead somebody on, I'm still leading them on. It's still my fault and I'm still hurting people. It is a extremely hypocritical belief system and, and it's not one that you can win. But I didn't understand that I could change that. And I didn't understand that that's not the way that things were. And I didn't understand that that's not the way that it had to be. I was just trying to survive and, and again, it was just feeding more into that depression and more of that realization that I can't do this. I can't do this life and I can't be this person that I'm supposed to be. I can't, I can't function with these rules. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not brave enough. And I'm a bad person. Now, as I was heading back to my company, they had all completed their FTX and I was headed back to meet them. I had to take a little bus from the hospital quarters that I was in to where my company stayed. As I get on the bus, there's about maybe three or four people on this bus. One of them is my boyfriend from high school. Although he had left before me, he also had some medical stuff going on and he had become a holdover. They don't let you move on until you heal. You have to heal. Even if they were going to discharge you, you have to heal before they'll let you leave most of the time. And so he was going back and forth to his own medical appointments and trying to get better before he could even continue on with the military or be discharged and go home. It was awkward because of the way that we had ended things, but I was still happy to see him. So I cautiously went and I sat near him. I sat across the aisle on the bus and we talked for just a few minutes. It was maybe four or five minutes till we got to where I needed to be dropped off. And it was just a, hey, how are you doing? What are you doing here? Oh, this is what's going on with me. What are you doing here? Oh, this is what's going on with me. And that was pretty much it. It wasn't enough 
to, that gravitation wasn't enough to pull me back in to want to be with him again, but it was enough to make me refocus. And it made me refocus on the person that did see me. I ended up going back with my group after they had completed the final rock march. And in order to graduate, you had to make up the march, which meant that you had to put on all the gear and then you had to walk around this track for 10 miles. Well, there was only one makeup day that you could have. And I, I desperately, I wanted to see my family on graduation. They were already planning on being there. They had booked their plane tickets and they knew I had contacted my mom and I told her I didn't know if I'd be able to graduate because I got hurt. And so they, they were all on standby and it was me trying my best to be able to make this happen. So that day, the one day where you had the makeup time where you could go around the track and make up that 10 mile ruck march was when I was supposed to go back to the, the, the hospital, the doctors or whatever, and I was supposed to get a checkup and see how my injuries were doing. So our, I think he was a first sergeant, he asked me when I was gonna go to my follow-up appointment. And I told him that I was not going to go to my follow-up appointment because I was going to make up the ruck march instead. Then the next couple hours later, as we are preparing and we're cleaning things and we're getting ready for the end of that cycle and for graduation, we're sterilizing all of our equipment and all of that, and we're, we're inventorying. Uh, my drill sergeant comes up to me and she says very begrudgingly that I get to graduate and I don't need to make up the ruck march. I was cleared of the ruck march. At the time, I didn't care why. I was just ready to go. I was all excited to get out of there. And of course, I understand now that it was because if they would have allowed me to do that march while I was knowing I was injured, then that could have been a lawsuit or at the very least, it would have caused a lot more medical stuff for them to have to do with me. So they cleared me of the march and I was able to graduate. I saw my family and it was great and I was exhausted and I was happy and and the boy who said that I would never be left alone and forgotten again his mom and my mom started talking and they exchanged phone numbers so that they could keep us in touch with each other so after we graduated from basic we went to all of us went to different directions I went to Fort Huachuca in Arizona and the boy that I had liked, he went to Virginia and all, we, we were all over the place. There was only one person who went to Arizona with me and he had a different job than I did. So we didn't even have AIT together per se, but we were still within the same proximity. During free time, we could still hang out with each other. But he was the one who sat down and showed me how to take apart and put together my weapon. So it was neat to have somebody at least that I knew in Arizona, otherwise I would have been completely alone. So because I was hurt, I had to be, it wasn't a hold over per se, but it was a hold under, but it wouldn't have mattered because I would have had to have that anyway. That AIT, my particular AIT was human, human intelligence collector, which is essentially interrogation. At the time, I don't know if it still is anymore, but at the time it was an 18 month long AIT. So after the first couple months, you actually had permanent party privileges, meaning that you could um, have your own vehicle. And once really class got started, some people could even apply to have an apartment where you couldn't stay off, because you're still a student, you couldn't stay off post at night on during the weeknights, but if, you had an apartment, you had the, all the weekends were completely yours. You were free. So you could stay at your own apartment if you wanted to. So there was a lot of privileges that we had that most other AIT uh, soldiers, students did not have because those AITs were only maybe like six weeks or 12 weeks or eight weeks or nine weeks long. They weren't a full year and a half long because, because ours was so long, you had more of those privileges. Well, the downside to that is that there's not a cycle going on all the time. So where there are basic training cycles going on all the time. 
So if you graduated from basic training and your AIT cycle hadn't started yet, you might have six months to just sit there before your actual training starts. So your 18 month training is actually a two year training because you're at this base for so long, waiting for the training to even start. It wasn't just me, there were plenty of soldiers from all over the place who were waiting for our group to start. Again, the male to female ratio is very different. I am one of three females, 50 males who were waiting with us. And what they did is they put us in, there was the, where we were staying is this place and they called it Eight Mile. And they, they thought they were clever and they said, do you know why it's called Eight Mile? And I said, because we're staying in a bunch of trailers. And they're like, whoa, yeah, you're the first person to get it. I doubt that that was true, but they were building some new barracks. And in the meantime, they had all of these trailers set up. And so these were our bays. And so one of the trailers was the female bay. So it was this big, long bay, which is three of us females in it. And then they had two or three other bays for the men. And then they had some that were just open and they're supposed to be like training centers or something. They, they were like office type of buildings and they had some office furniture in it, maybe like a couple chairs here and there, some desks, tables, and that was it. Like they had power, so there was light, but they didn't have, there was like, there was nothing. There was no TVs, there was no computers. I don't even know if there was a clock in there. And this, this was um, 15 years ago. So not everybody had a cell phone like they do now. You were allowed to have one if you had one. And even the people who had them, they weren't, they didn't have smartphones. Or if they did, like they had Blackberry but they didn't have smartphones like we have them today. So it's not like people were just in there on their phones entertaining themselves. This is a room full of 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 plus kids who were being unsupervised, who are just waiting in this empty trailer for a drill sergeant to come grab you. And so we were like the detail squad pretty much. If there was something that needed to be cleaned, they would come grab a handful of us to do it. If there was a job that needed to be done, they'd come grab another handful of us to do it. So we, were, we would wake up in the morning and we would have to do PT. If you didn't have, like you, for me, I had to do modified stuff um, because of my injuries. And then you'd go to breakfast and then you'd report to formation. Um, after you showered and all of that, you'd report to formation. And then from formation, you would go and you would just sit in this building all day unsupervised. And these kids were bored. And again, there's three of us females and a ton of males. So again, if I thought I had attention before, I did not know what attention was. And thankfully me and the two females, we got along great. Like they became really, really close with me. And um, we had a great, strong little group together. So it's not like there was any kind of animosity. We really got along well. And but I mean, I had grown up now with mostly guy friends that it wasn't that big of a deal for me to start being around all these guys and enjoying the attention and enjoying flirting. So time goes on and there's, there's some in our group who have already graduated and they pretty much get to come and go as they please. They don't have to stay there all day if they don't want to. And they're chummy with the drill sergeants because they've gone through all of this. Um, one in particular, he was just waiting for his assignment. And his, again, because the AIT is so long, you get really close with the people that you're going to the school with. And he had actually fallen in love with one of the female soldiers and they got married during the, their AIT. And while she was in Afghanistan, Afghanistan? No, maybe she was in Iraq at the time. She was overseas in the Middle East and he was still at AIT waiting for orders to either go overseas or to be assigned to a base. And I don't know what was taking so long, but he was there for months waiting for some sort of assignment and something was going on with his paperwork and they couldn't get him assigned anywhere. But because again, he had already gone through all of that, he was still technically a student because he was, on a, he was in a teaching area, but he 
he wasn't a student because he graduated. He'd gone through all this, so he had all the freedoms that he really wanted. The only reason he hung around is just because he was bored. And most of the times, if he wanted to go somewhere, he would just hop in his car and he would go. And the drill sergeants didn't care. And because he was so chummy with the drill sergeants, they knew when he received the letter from his wife saying that she wanted to divorce and she served him papers while she was overseas. And he was really sad and he was really upset. I, I was still suffering from depression and suicide and I was hurt um, because of my ankle and my knee and my hips and I was lonely and my, even though I was having fun kind of, you know, hanging with these kids all day, the depression was always the most dominant thing for me. And the desire to kill myself was always, it didn't, it didn't matter how much fun I was having, that was always the most dominant thing. So I had a bunch of pain pills that were given to me because of my injuries at basic. And I remember I took the whole bottle and I don't know if I said something or what the whole, I, my, I don't really have much memory of that. Um, it's pretty blurry, but they ended up taking me to a civilian hospital where they made me throw it up, all up. And they asked me, did you try to kill yourself? And although I did, I told them, no, I didn't. I said that it was because I was in pain and they had told me if I hurt to take them and I kept hurting, so I kept taking them. That's, that's the story that I told them. So they didn't quite believe me and they still ended up putting me on suicide watch. And that was devastating because it was Halloween and I could have been able to go off post and party with my friends and they were all getting hotel rooms and you know everyone who was over 21 was going to be supplying the alcohol and here I am 18 and thinking like I'm going to hang out with these older kids and I'm going to have this experience that's the closest thing to college like fraternity and sorority life that I'll ever come close to and I wasn't able to go and I cried and I cried and I cried and it was awful. So the drill sergeants knew, they knew that I said I didn't try to kill myself, but they also didn't believe me. So they also knew that I was sad. And one of the female drill sergeants told me to go hang out with this soldier who his wife had sent him the divorce papers. And because of the fact that I was on suicide watch, my freedoms were taken away and I wasn't allowed off post. Well, she told us that she would look the other way and pretty much just don't get caught if I went off post with him. And as dumb as it sounds, like we're pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a town nearby and um, there's like a, a small shopping mall. But he asked if I wanted to go to, maybe it was Phoenix. Whatever the nearest big city was, that was probably like an hour and a half away or so, two hours away. He asked if I wanted to go there and go to the mall there. And here I am, I'm 18 years old and I have all this money that I haven't been able to spend for the last several months. And for me, it feels like the most money I've ever had in my life. Well, at the time it was the most money I'd ever had in my life. And I had no responsibilities and I had no bills and I had this opportunity to go shopping and feel normal and get civilian clothes and I am excited. I am so excited. Put on top of that, that this guy had a cherry red convertible and we're gonna be driving through the desert in it. I was beside myself excited. And the drill sergeant was literally giving me her blessing and she told me to go hang out with him and she told me she's gonna look the other way and I'm not gonna get in trouble and I'm just, I'm all for it. I am ready to go. Now this guy, he was from Arizona and he told me that he needed to stop by his dad's friend's house to get something. And would I mind if we stopped there first before we went on our way and then I could meet his dad's friend and say, hey, he was like, 
you know, a second dad to him. And he's telling me like, he's pretty much grown up with this dude and he's like really cool. And he just wants to like stop in and grab whatever he left and then we'll head out. I'm like, that's fine, no worries. So we pull up to this house and it's literally in the middle of nowhere. There's no other houses around. And I don't remember how long we drove, maybe it was an hour. And we enter into the house and the front of the house seems normal. And there's a, there's a couch and there's a coffee table and a TV off to your right. There's a kind of kitchenette table off to the left and a little kitchen area. And straight ahead is a hallway. At the end of a hallway is a room and in the hallway to the left is a restroom. And he leads me in down the hallway into this room and I'd never seen a room like this before. I don't know if you've ever been in a basement that is part of the basement is above ground. So at the very top of the room, there's these long windows. This house was not underground. This, this house was a regular one story house, but the only window in the room was at the top of the room and it was long and it, if I would have jumped, I could probably see through it, but standing, looking at it, I could only see the sky. I couldn't see what was outside. And there was no furniture in this room, but there were pillows and blankets on the floor. And he turned to me and he told me that he was gonna go get a condom. And, oh, and, and there was no friend there. There was no friend of the family there. It was. The, it was just us. So I didn't do anything. It was the first time in my life that I mentally left my body. And I didn't fight. I didn't say yes. I didn't say no. I, I just froze. And when he was done, we didn't talk about it we got in the car and I don't know how long it was till we got to the mall wherever it was we even went and we had lunch and then I don't even think we shopped if we did I don't even remember it and he brought me back as if nothing had happened and I was confused because I liked this other guy and I was wondering, am I, am I in a relationship with this guy now? Cause we had just done that. Do I have feelings for him? Did I, invite that? Was I flirting too much? Did I make him believe we were in a relationship? I ended up telling the girls that were in my bay and I told them how what had happened and how I didn't really want to do that, but it's okay. Cause it's not like it was rape or something. <laughs> and I remember what the older of the two, she, she was like, um, yes, that, that is rape. 
And I remember being so confused because I literally thought that again because we didn't talk about this at school we didn't talk about it in my home we didn't talk about it in private school all i knew is the exposure that i had through movies and tv and i thought that rape was getting like jumped in a dark alley by a stranger i thought rape was violent and uh, somebody that you didn't know i had no idea what rape actually was. And so when she told me that, I felt scared, but I wasn't sure if I believed her. And a couple nights later, they, you have this thing called fire guard, where one person from your bay has to stay up all night and guard the others. And so it was my night for fire guard. And again, we're in these trailers and there's not really any security like there is if there's a big brick building like you can just open the door and nobody's the wiser there's no cameras or anything like that and so he comes to the back door and he is wasted and he is crying and he is asking if we can have sex and I'm telling him no and I'm pushing him away and I'm saying you know the girls are asleep and I have I'm on fire guard and he kept pushing and he kept pushing and he kept pushing and I, I gave in and, and after all of that, my phone died. So anyway, I had given in and I remember looking at the girls and it's a, it was a long bay and it's completely open. And I remember having my head turned and I'm begging them telepathically to wake up and they did not wake up. After that, I did try to take my life. Um, I didn't have access to a lot of things because I was already being watched. Um, so I had a CD and I broke a CD and I tried to cut my wrists and I went across instead of down but even it wouldn't have mattered because I couldn't get deep enough. I couldn't take the pain to go deep enough to do any real damage anyway. And I was still in touch with the boy from basic training who I had liked. And technically we were kind of like we were together, even though we weren't really together. And um, for all intents and purposes, though, we were in agreement that we were together and that we cared about each other and that we even loved each other. And I, I told him about what happened and I didn't, I didn't tell the truth about everything because I felt with my own judgments that, um, that I deserved it or I don't know. I, I felt that it wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't fit the bill of rape the way I thought that rape was. And so I felt like I had to retell the story more violently than it actually happened. And in doing that, you know, ends up discrediting yourself anyway. And then as time went on, it's like, did this even really happen? Did it, did it, were, did I cheat on him? Were, were we together? Was that a relationship? I didn't know. And the only person that I had, that had told me otherwise, I didn't know if I believed her because I didn't, I still, I still just didn't know if I agreed that that was rape. Even though I didn't want it, I, I didn't say no, even though he took me to this place in the middle of nowhere, um, that I didn't agree to that encounter. I didn't know that was going to happen. I still felt like it was my fault. And so after I was trying to hurt myself, back then you could kind of get away with it more because um, duct tape jewelry was all the rage, duct tape wallets, duct tape whatever. So I had created a duct tape bracelet for myself to go over where I had hurt myself. And now there's actually a tattoo over it. Um, 
there were a couple people that knew. There was one person that I went out to lunch with and he, it got caught on the duct tape like the scab did and it pulled and it started bleeding and he saw that it was bleeding and it made him really uncomfortable. He's like, are you gonna do something about that? And I was like, yeah, it'll stop in a minute. And I was really stupid about it. So when a couple of days later, when um, the chaplain came with, again, somebody else and I can't remember who, what all their ranks were, came to me um, and they asked to see my wrist and they made me cut the duct tape bracelet off and I showed them the wrist and then they went ahead and started the process to discharge me from the military for trying to kill myself. And of course, at that point, they did not believe that the first attempt or they believed that the first incident was an attempt and they didn't believe me that it wasn't, which they were correct. So I blamed this the guy that I went to lunch with, I blamed him in my mind for telling that I had tried to kill myself and getting me essentially kicked out of the military. I found out years later that it was actually the guy that we, that I met at basic training, that we liked each other. That felt like a bit of huge betrayal to realize that it was because of him, which, you know, hindsight, I'm grateful because he saved my life. So I end up getting out and the guy that liked me, he flies to Oregon because he's already graduated his AIT by this point. Cause again, there's different lengths. So the whole time that I hadn't even really started mine, he is, um, he had finished his. So he got out before I did and he flew to Oregon right before Christmas time. And he got there like two days before I did. So he's like hanging out with my family and I'm jealous and angry because I want to be home so badly. And they're all having this good time. And I'm like crying my eyes out, trying to just get all of the paperwork done so I can finally go home and be done with it and be out of the military. And I get home and I think it was the day before Christmas Eve. Maybe it was Christmas Eve when I got home and Christmas day, he proposed to me and I accepted. And part of it was I had strong feelings for him. The other part of it was I was just running, I was still running from everything. And I just felt like, again, my two options were marry somebody or military and the military didn't work out. And I still believe that I was unintelligent. And especially now at this point, I fully believed that I needed somebody that I just, I, I didn't trust myself. And I, I reaffirmed in my mind that I'm a bad person. And, you know, I'm lying about things and I'm hating myself, blaming myself, but I'm excited now because I'm engaged, so it can't be too bad. Maybe the worst is over. Maybe my life is finally going to take a direction that is is happy. And I'm full in victim mode, like full, like all of this is happening to me. Um, I don't think that I'm powerless per se, because I'm thinking I'm the one causing all of it, which again, isn't necessarily incorrect. Um, but just the judgments aren't, aren't helping me. My self judgments and my belief systems are not helping me. So he and I are engaged and he stays around for a couple of weeks, um, through New Year's and then he flies back to South Carolina. And so my mom took me aside and she said, I think that you should move to South Carolina before you guys get married because you've only met each other in this training environment. You don't know each other in the civilian world you should probably get to know each other outside of the military and make sure that you actually do want to marry each other. And I respected her words then, I saw the wisdom in them then, and I see the wisdom in them now. So the plan was that come springtime, a couple months, I would be moving from Oregon to South Carolina to live with him for a few months before we got married that June. 
I spent most of my time, if not almost all of my time, hanging out with my friends and partying with my friends. The words that I literally said were, this is the last time that I'm gonna see my friends, but my family will be around forever. And I had to eat those words very soon. But I spent all of my time hanging out with different people, doing different things. And one of our friends from high school, he was older than us. And so he had his own apartment and he could buy alcohol. And here I am, I'm still 18. And most of my other friends, the ones who are not either in the military or away at college, and they're kind of doing, they're working or they're doing the community college thing at first. The ones that are still around, we all get together and we hang out at this other friend's house um, because he can supply us with alcohol. So I go over there with all of them and we're partying and I end up passing out on the couch. And at some point, everybody else left. I don't know, it was just me and this guy who, it was his apartment. And I woke up to him undoing my pants and putting his hand down my pants. And I was scared, so I didn't know what to do. So I just made it like I had just woken up. And I made a sound and moved and he pulled his hand out of my pants and just kind of left it at that. And so I asked him, I said, why are my pants undone? And he said that he didn't know. So I got up and I left. And I, by the time I got into my car, I was just shaking. So I called my fiance and I told him what happened. And he is livid. And he makes me give him the phone number of the guy who owned the apartment. So I did. And he calls him up and he is chewing him out. And he calls me back and he said, you better get your ass on a plane to South Carolina tomorrow or there's not gonna be a wedding. So I didn't know how to explain to my parents why I needed to get on a plane to South Carolina, but I had to say something, I had to convince them. And I don't even really remember what I said. It was something along the lines of like, we miss each other and we really need to see each other. I don't know. But um, somehow I convinced my parents to buy a plane ticket for me so that I could go to South Carolina earlier than I intended. I didn't tell them what actually happened because I was more afraid for them to find out that I was drinking underage than for them to find out that I had been assaulted. And my fiance was livid because clearly what had happened in the military, um, I had, had put myself in a bad situation. And then again, I come home and I'm putting myself again in a bad situation and I can't be trusted. Um, pretty much, you know, he needs to watch me and make sure that I'm making good decisions. Again, I didn't disagree with him. I, I fully believed him and, and, you know, again, even now I'm not saying that he's wrong. Everything that happened, I understand needed to happen for the way that the rest of everything unfolds. Two days after I got to South Carolina, my mom and both my brothers were in a car accident. My 10 year old brother and my mom died and my eight year old brother was the only survivor. I know now that a catalyst was needed to get me out of Oregon. Something drastic was needed to get me to move and to leave the state. It could have been much worse. Yes, a friend had betrayed me. Yes, he had attempted to take advantage of me. But thankfully nothing actually happened other than the betrayal and the loss of a friendship. It could have been much worse, but it was enough of a catalyst that got me on a plane and got me safely in South Carolina. South Carolina became my cleft of the rock, whether I liked it or not. It was my sacred place. It was my place of protection while I was mourning. And there's a lot more that happens after this, but I haven't fully gone into that. And I know this video is already long enough. But what I'm going to show still is the, the way that the two videos are connected. After I decided to not run from the traumas anymore, and I decided to start forgiving myself, 
and I saw the new perspective of the way that things happened. I forgave myself for hating myself. I forgave myself for believing I was a victim. I forgave myself for believing that I was powerless. I forgave myself for blaming my naivety, for getting in that situation. I forgave myself for feeling that it wasn't bad enough that I had to lie about it in order for it to be taken seriously. I forgave myself for having conflicting feelings about the whole situation and for wondering if I had feelings for that guy because I had unwillingly shared my body with him. I forgave myself for believing I could have done anything different as far as receiving the attention from the guys in high school and the guys in the military. And I asked Spirit, what was the point of the relationship with the boyfriend in high school. Now that's gonna be for the next video because that one spans through all of them. But I was shown that everybody played their parts perfectly. And if you were to think of before we come here, if you have this imaginary, just use your imagination. You have this imaginary round table conversation before you decide to come into this life. And you meet all the people that you're gonna come across and you agree to co-create with them and have these symbiotic experiences where they can assist you in helping you find your purpose work, but also helping you to experience things that you want to experience. Everybody played their part perfectly. I, I couldn't deny that. Had I gone from private school straight into the army and not had those two years of public school, I don't know what I would have done. I probably would not have um, ended up having a relationship with my fiance who then later became my husband and the father of my two children. I may have ended up having kids, but I don't know who or what that situation would have been. Um, I, I feel like it would have been worse than, than how I handled it. And again, I had to forgive myself for the judgments so that I didn't handle it well because I handled it to the best of the ability. And, and could I forgive myself for the fact that there's no other, I couldn't have handled it any other way. I didn't know how, but what it did High school, receiving that attention prepared me on a small scale. I had two years of time to be able to adjust to that and acclimate to that to, to some point at least before going into the army. I can't fathom what would have happened had I not had that experience and, and knowing and having those hurts too and having those judgments to myself kept me from doing a lot of things I probably would have done in the military because I already had these fresh wounds of self-hatred holding me back from making further potential mistakes. Understanding that I believed that it was my job as a female to cater to the egos of all men Going back to the first video, I understood why it was hard for me to say no, even if the answer was no. I don't want to hurt people's feelings, I don't want to hurt people, even to the extent of my own pain. And that doesn't make it okay what that boy did, I understand that he knew what he was doing. After I got out of the military and after I got divorced, I ended up getting counseling and she helped me to understand that regardless of the situation, he knew what he was doing. And he took me in the middle of nowhere to some house and he announced what his intentions were 
without a conversation, without a question, he knew what he was doing. Regardless of what I said or didn't say, or what my fears were, or what my fears weren't. And can I forgive myself for believing it was my fault? That was harder. But I can. And again, the friend who, whose apartment we all drank at, I've forgiven him years ago. Doesn't mean I want to see him. Doesn't mean he's in my life or ever will be. But I have forgiven him because I do understand that a catalyst was needed to get me out of Oregon. Because the fact of the matter was, I, at that time I smoked cigarettes. And my, of course my parents were not happy about it, uh, rightly so. So they were driving through the mountains to meet my stepdad. And either I would have gone on that trip with them and I would have taken my own car so that I could have smoked. And my little brothers probably would have wanted to ride with me more than likely because that was the way that it was back then. And I would have told them no because I wouldn't, want to, I wouldn't have wanted them in the car with me while I smoked. And it would have been more important for me to smoke than to ride with my mom or have my brothers ride with me. So had I been following my mom in my car and witnessed their deaths after what had already happened, after just having gone through that experience in the military, after ha trying to take my life and failing on two separate occasions, being hospitalized for one of them, after the assault that had just happened, at that point would have been three days prior, I have zero doubts in my mind that I would have been alive today. If I didn't end up in South Carolina, I know I would have taken my life in Oregon. I would have not have gone to marry him. I would not have cared. I would have said, screw it. Probably some other choice words. And I would have gone off the deep end and either I would have drank myself to death, I would have ended up in my own car accident, I would have taken my own life. I would have got on drugs. I'm not sure, but I know I would not have survived very long if I would have witnessed that, especially not being in the car. Because as much as I would love to say I would have been in that car, I know at the time, I know I would have wanted to smoke and I would have taken my own car and I would have witnessed it. So something was needed, something drastic was needed to get me across the country. And I just can't deny that. So I can't, I do fully understand that part. And I am grateful because even though that friend betrayed me with his actions and what he did, he saved my life. And then when I got to, when I was in South Carolina and that happened, I did, I went off the deep end for a little bit and we were drinking a lot and I didn't care. And I didn't, I literally, I didn't care about anything. I didn't care about myself. You know, I love my fiance, but he, he didn't get it. He'd never lost anyone before. He tried his best, but he didn't understand depression. He didn't understand loss. He didn't understand anything I was going through. And for him, he did not get the girl he fell in love with. The girl he fell in love with was perky and yeah, she had her bouts with depression and suicide and yeah, she was wounded and somebody for him to fix and protect and the whole damsel in distress thing, which I will tell you gets real old real fast. But I was skinny and I was pretty and I was crazy and fun and, and you know, he, that's not the girl he ended up getting because I was mourning and I was lonely and I was not mentally well. And we ended up really quickly getting pregnant with our son. And although I was scared, I always say that my son gave me joy because it was a reason to live. 
being pregnant with him kept me alive long enough to hold him for the first time. And I remember the first time I heard him cry, I cried. And I felt instantly in that moment an unconditional love I didn't even know existed. And I felt like there was sunshine in my life for the first time. And if for nothing else, this child needed me to stay alive. And I fought and I fought and I fought and I fought. And I can say I did. I, I still have those moments sometimes. And I've, I've had them throughout the years. But I understand that part of the mental illness and I understand that those thoughts, they're thoughts. The feelings are real, but the thoughts aren't. And one of the things that I tell my clients is that your feelings are real, but doesn't make them true. I can give it a voice. Those thoughts, they're coming up because something's triggering them. Either it's sorrow or it's shame or it's embarrassment or it's loneliness or it's fear or whatever it is. There's a reason that it's getting triggered. And now, especially that I'm a life coach, I can coach myself through it, but I also have an amazing team of coach friends and my own coach who's helping me through all of this as well. So I don't have to do it alone, even though I could. So I'll leave you with this for this video. The next video, I'll finish the story of these last six weeks and what I've come to stop running from and face and heal so that I can move on and I can have my life and I can be courageous and strong in myself and understand my value and my worth and who I am. And I'm not a victim. I am a creator and I'm a co-creator with others and this life, it's what I'm going to make it to be and I'm no longer going to sit in the passenger seat and ride where it takes me. I love you guys so much. I hope that this has inspired you or given you a different perspective, maybe helped you with something that you experienced that might've been similar on some levels. I hope you guys have a great day and I will see you next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.